Hello and welcome to today's lesson on Rutherford scattering, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQAA level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at how we can detail the discovery of the nucleus. So if we've been successful today and we've learned in this lesson, we should be able to describe how the nucleus was discovered, explain why the nucleus was not discovered earlier, and finally work out how close the alpha particle can get to the nucleus in Rutherford scattering. So in today's lesson, we're covering the following part of the AQAA level physics specification. 3.8.1.1 Rutherford scattering. So you must have an appreciation of how the knowledge and understanding of the structure of the nucleus has changed over time. So to look at this, we will start at what we originally thought was the smallest particle in the universe, the atom. So the first model of the atom came from the chemist John Dalton. So John Dalton's atomic theory was that atoms are indestructible and indivisible, and they can't be divided into any smaller particles. Now Dalton's model is good for explaining the ideas of compounds, elements and mixtures. However, in 1897, the electron was discovered and found to be inside atoms. This meant we needed to amend this model of the atom because scientific models have to be changed if the experimental results show that the previous model is wrong. So a new scientific model is created which can explain the experimental results. So just to clarify, a scientific model is an idea or theory which is used to explain observations and data made in experiments. So with this, J.J. Thompson replaced the Dalton model with something called the Plum Pudding model because when J.J. Thompson discovered the electron Dalton's model of the atom was no longer acceptable because there was now something inside of the atom. So Thompson believed that the atom was made of positively charged matter with negatively charged electrons scattered throughout like plums in a plum pudding or chocolate chips in a chocolate chip cookie. So the plum pudding model was the first attempt at redefining what an atom looked like. So scientists were desperate to see if the plum pudding model was correct. So like said before, in the theory of the plum pudding model, Thompson realized that the plums or the chocolate chips were the negative electrons whilst the solid filling was a positive charge. In this idea, the atom is completely solid and there's no space in the atom. So it's important to note that we don't refer to protons in the plum pudding model, only positive charge, and that in this model, the atom is completely solid. There is no space at all in our atom for the plum pudding model. So this model was used to explain the experimental observations of electrons. This model also explained why the atom was electrically uncharged. So just please do remember in this plum pudding model that there was no space inside of the atom. Now, we please note as well that the atom consists of both positive charge okay, and electrons. So with our new um, observations and data, we could then amend our previous model to make our new model, which did explain our new observations of the electron. Because please remember that a new model is always proposed if we need to explain new observations and data. So J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model was a very, very important concept in the history of particle physics because it's our first guess at how the atom was constructed. So Thompson's plum pudding model is what we believe believe the atom was until the director of particle physics at the University of Manchester, Ernest Rutherford, came along. So he carried out the gold foil experiment or the Rutherford scattering experiment in 1910 to test out whether the plum pudding model was true. So he bombarded thin gold foil with beams of alpha particles and he expected to be just like firing bullets at tissue paper. The famous quote was, if the positive charge was evenly spread out like Tom and said then the beam should easily pass through. So what happened in this particular test to look at the structure of the atom? So Rutherford got a layer of gold foil one atom thick. Now in reality it wasn't one atom thick but a couple of hundred of a couple of hundred of atoms layer thick because it's very difficult at a one atom thick layer. So what happened then is Rutherford got a source which emitted alpha particles. So the positively charged alpha nucleus okay, was fired from irradiation guns such as uranium. Now at this point alpha radiation 
radiation was a new discovery of science. So alpha radiation is a type of radiation emitted from the nucleus which increases the stability of the nucleus. So as well we know that alpha radiation is ionizing which means it can ionize your DNA which can mutate your DNA and can lead to cancer. So this alpha particle source is, is important because it emitted alpha particles which are made of two protons and two neutrons commonly called the helium nucleus. So this meant the alpha particle had an overall positive charge. Now Rutherford placed these uh, gold foil and the alpha particle source in a vacuum and he fired the alpha particles at the gold foil. Now it's important to use a vacuum chamber because alpha particles would be ionized if there was air in between the alpha particles and the gold atoms. They would stop within about five centimeters of air. So if there was no vacuum chamber then the alpha particles would never even have reached the gold atoms. And in addition the alpha particles must be all traveling with the same kinetic energy otherwise the results of the investigation would be invalid. Now Rutherford then placed an alpha particle detector beyond the gold foil and then Rutherford moved the angle of the alpha particle detector and then fired the alpha particles of the gold foil and measured what happens to the alpha particles after they pass through the gold foil. So he moved it around into different positions. Now Rutherford expected that the fast moving alpha particles should smash straight through our plum pudding model atoms because Rutherford expected this because the alpha particles are fired out of the radiation gun, the uranium, at a very fast speed whilst the gold, whilst the gold atoms are considered stationary. So he thought it would be like an artillery shell being fired through a piece of tissue paper. They just smash all the way through. But what did happen when Rutherford fired the alpha particles at the gold foil? So Rutherford found that most alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil like expected. Now this actually happened because the gold atoms are predominantly empty space. So the first conclusion is that the atom is mostly empty space. Now a few of the alpha particles deflected away as they passed through. Now, now the alpha particles are always deflected away from the nucleus. Now the nucleus will also recoil slightly in the movement but this is a much smaller due to the larger mass. This occurs due to the conservation of momentum. Now why do we get this repulsion taking place? Well we get this repulsion taking place as there must be a positive charge in the atom because the positive charge of the atom and the positive charge of the alpha particle must be repelling each other. So the second conclusion was that the nucleus of the atom must be positively charged. Now it was later realized that the positive charge of the atom could be broken down into smaller units or particles which were named protons. Now like mentioned before for the fast moving alpha particles to be deflected by the nucleus the alpha particles must be striking something much more massive than themselves which indicated that most of the mass of the atom must be found in the nucleus because we must have the conservation of momentum that when this deflection occurs that most of the mass must be inside the nucleus of the atom. Now the last thing is that 1 in 10,000 alpha particles reflected backwards off the atoms. Now they do not literally reflect, rather they repel each other without touching, which we call backscatter. Now this occurs due to the large repulsion between the positively charged alpha particles and the positively charged nucleus. This occurs as the alpha particle would be directly contacting the nucleus, it would hit dead on. Now the, because 1 in 10,000 alpha particles will reflect backwards and this, the only alpha particles that will be hitting dead on, this indicates that the nucleus itself cannot be that large but we should really talk about these things in terms of nuclear radius and atomic radius. So because only 1 in 10,000 alpha particles will backscatter in this particular experiment this indicates that whilst the nucleus has a positive charge and is extremely massive it must have a very small radius. So this showed us that the nucleus of the, of the, um, of the atom must have a much smaller radius compared to the actual atomic radius itself. So the third conclusion is that the radius of the nucleus is much smaller compared to the radius of the atom. We actually believe that the nuclear radius is about 10,000 times smaller than the atomic radius. Now we can compare these results with the expected results if the plum pudding model was true and the experimental results do not fit the old model. So this meant that Rutherford had to come up with a new model to explain the results. So Rutherford devised a new scientific model which explains the observations of his experiment. So because most 
mostly alpha particles pass straight through the nuclear as straight through the gold atoms, it indicated to us that the atom is mostly empty space. Secondly, because most of the alpha particles are reflected when they pass near the centre of the gold atom, the nucleus must be positively charged. And finally, because about 1 in 10,000 alpha particles were deflected by more than 90 degrees, the diameter of the nucleus is about 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of the atom, which is very, very important to understand. So to explain these results and observations, a new model of the atom was proposed. Firstly, inside every atom is a nucleus, and the nucleus contains all of the mass of the atom. It contains all of the positive charge of the atom, and it's a very, very dense material, it's a very, very dense object. So we can say that the nucleus contains most of the mass, it has a radius 10,000 times smaller than the atom. Now, the results from our Rutherford, part, our Rutherford experiment, our alpha particle scattering experiment, led to the conclusion that the mass of the atom was concentrated at the center in the nucleus nucleus and the nucleus was charged. So this nuclear model replaced the plum pudding model. Now later Niels Bohr adapted the nuclear model by suggesting that electrons orb the nuclei at specific distances, which was an amendment because the theoretical calculations of Bohr agreed with the experimental observations. Now later experiments led to the idea that the positive charge of any nucleus could be subdivided into a whole number of smaller particles, each particle having the same amount of positive charge. Now the name proton was given to these particles. Now if the nucleus was only made from protons, you'd expect massive nuclei to have very high charges compared to low mass nuclei, but the charges were observed to be much lower than expected. So Rutherford proposed the idea of a proton-electron doublet being part of the nucleus in 1920 to help explain this observation. He didn't realise it at the time, but he was actually referring to the nucleus with the idea of the the neutron. So what happened was the experimental work of James Chadwick provided the existence to show that the neutrons must exist within the nucleus. And this was about 20 years after the nucleus became an accepted scientific idea okay, in 1932. So in looking at the Rutherford scattering experiment, we should be aware of, firstly, the conditions of the experiment, secondly, the results of the experiment, and thirdly, the conclusions of the experiment. Now, with this work, Rutherford had worked out the density of the nucleus and the charge of the nucleus, but he had also estimated the radius of the nucleus in this experiment. So how can we use the Rutherford scattering experiment to calculate the radius of the nucleus? So to understand how Rutherford derived the nuclear radius, you've got to consider the conditions of the investigation and consider an alpha particle moving to hit towards the nucleus. Now in this derivation, we assume the nucleus is not moving at all. Now the alpha particle has a kinetic energy and is moving since it's being projected from a radiation gun. Now a radiation gun, like mentioned earlier, is given to any substance is a name given to any substance which emits radiation. Now as the alpha particle approaches the nucleus, repulsion occurs as both objects are positively charged. Now the interaction of the electromagnetic force between the particles causes the energy store to change. So what happens is the alpha particle and nucleus are held stationary due to electrical potential energy because the alpha particle and the nucleus are repelling each other due to similar positive charges. So what will happen is that the kinetic energy at the start of the experiment will turn into electrical potential energy. So due to the conservation of energy, we can state that the kinetic energy at the start of the investigation equals the electrical potential energy at the end of the investigation. So the initial kinetic energy of the alpha particle will transfer to the electrical potential energy. So we can substitute in the equations for kinetic energy and electrical potential energy into this particular equation. So we know that the kinetic energy equation from GCSE physics is a half mv squared. And from the electrical fields module, we know that the equation for electrical potential energy is q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon squared r. Now we can rearrange this equation to make r radius the subject. So we can therefore work out what r is going to be. And we can then substitute also in the kinetic energy term. And we can therefore say that r is equal to q1, Q2 
Q2 over the kinetic energy times by 4 pi epsilon 0. Now this is an important idea because this was actually the first estimation derived for the nuclear radius in physics. But this radius that you would calculate with this equation is an overestimate as it's not the actual size of the nuclear radius, rather it's the distance that the alpha particle gets to the nucleus before stopping. So it's actually dependent on the initial kinetic energy of the alpha particle, which wouldn't be the case if you were actually measuring the nuclear radius itself. So this radius that you're calculating in this particular equation is a maximum possible value of the nuclear radius, not an accurate value. So this radius of the nucleus calculated is actually better known as the distance of closest approach. It's the closest distance the alpha particle can get to the nucleus before it's backscattered. Now, we can derive the distance of closest approach by Firstly, working out the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Then secondly, working out the potential energy of the repulsion, which has an, a radius term in it. Then equating the two values and solving for the missing R term. Now, Rutherford did carry out this calculation in 1905 when he carried out his Rutherford scattering experiment. And for gold, which has a charge of 79 times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 okay, coulombs. And then he solved this to get us a radius of 4 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. He then compared this with the diameter of the gold atom, which was measured to be about 3 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So for the first time, Rutherford had actually estimated that the nucleus of the of the uh, of the atom must have a radius 10,000 times smaller than the atom itself. So this meant that the atom is mostly empty, which is what we thought earlier when most of the alpha particles went straight through. Now it's very important to emphasize that this calculation gives an upper limit on the size of the gold nucleus. We cannot say that the alpha particle touches the nucleus and a more energetic alpha particle might get closer still. But what it does mean to us though is that this was the first calculation which indicated to us that the atom is mostly empty, which is why most of the alpha particles went straight through. Now, like we previously said, the nucleus and the alpha particles repelled each other. But what is this repulsive force? Well, this repulsive force is the electrostatic repulsion. It's Coulomb's law because they've got two positively charged um, objects. So we can use Coulomb's law to calculate the force between the alpha particle and the positive charge in the gold atom. So so we can also say that the actual repulsive force experienced by the alpha particle and the nucleus is equal to Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared, where Q1 is the, is the positive charge of the gold atom, which is 79 times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Q2 is the charge of the alpha particle, which is 2 times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And r is the distance of closest approach between the nucleus and the alpha particle. So if we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to have a qualitative study of Rutherford scattering and appreciation of how the knowledge and understanding of the structure of the nucleus has changed over time. Now, if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to describe how the nucleus was discovered, explain why the nucleus was not discovered earlier, and we can work out how the closest, how close an alpha particle can get to the nucleus in the Rutherford scattering experiment. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on Rutherford scattering, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.